We're going to be in Mark chapter 11 this morning. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Mark chapter 11. We'll spend most of our time this morning in verses 20 through 26, although we got to backtrack just a little bit. You may remember a couple of weeks ago we, we read about uh, an event where Jesus with his disciples were with a fig tree and the fig tree wasn't producing any fruit and Jesus cursed that fig tree and we didn't see much in that passage when we read it uh, and then we were taken to the, the temple cleansing uh, event that we talked about and I told you we would go back and, and look at these couple of verses because uh, they would tie into something we were going to read later and so the, the, the event of Jesus cursing the fig tree and the events that we're going to see today, the, the temple cleansing uh, event took place in between that. And so we will go back up and we will also read verses 12, 13, and 14. And then we'll jump down and read verses 20 through 26 and kind of get an idea of this, this, this whole event as it unfold, unfolded. Uh, now, this passage today is is kind of difficult. There's a lot that really could be said about it, more than could be said than in the short time that we have together. Uh, I thought about for just a brief second, you know, maybe this passage should be split up and looked at some of the different aspects that are talked about, but very quickly I decided that I don't think that that's a good idea for this passage, and even though we could probably pluck out a verse or two in this passage we're going to read, and we could probably focus on three different points at least in some of these verses if we were to take them out and stand, let them stand alone. The fact is that Jesus put all of these things together, and so I believe that they go together. It's not that we can't get something from, from some of them individ, individually or from a couple of them together, but I believe when Jesus taught this to the disciples, he taught this as one, as one big piece that needs to go together. I think all of these things play together and connect together in some way, but it's a way that, that may not be immediately obvious to us, even after we read and think about this passage. Not, not the things that Jesus says, not that they don't make sense. We would agree with some of the, some of the things we're going to look at because we see some of these very themes expressed through the rest of the New Testament. But the difficulty is, how exactly do all these things tie together? Because it just kind of seems like you go from one to another in a couple of these instances, and it may not seem that these things quite go together, but they do. Jesus put them together, and so we need to be prayerful that God would help us to see maybe what, what the big picture was that Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples and to, to you and I. And so you may read these verses, and you may say, oh, yeah, I know exactly what Jesus meant there. Or you may be like me and say, well, yeah, I understand what he's saying, but... But man, it seems kind of weird the way it's put together. And maybe some of that was in the way Mark recorded this, or maybe Mark recorded it just as it happened, and maybe the disciples maybe had a better grasp of what Jesus was saying. Now, you will find this same event covered in Mark chapter 21, and in, or excuse me, in Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew's account, it's all, it's all together. It's all one event that happened at the same time. As to where Mark's, we have a division. Jesus curses this fig tree at one, one occasion, and then they return to it soon thereafter the next day, and Jesus explains what's going on when the disciples are, are kind of amazed that this fig tree is, is already dead and withering at the roots. So we will... Look at this, these passages. We will read verses 12 through 14. Then we'll jump down to verse 20 and read through 26. Then I'll pray, and then we will jump in. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. The next day when they came out from Bethany, he was hungry. Now that's Jesus that's talking about there. After seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Verse 20. Early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, 
the fig tree you cursed is withered. Jesus replied to them, Have faith in God, I assure you. If anyone says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your wrongdoing. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning, and I thank you that we can come here and study your words. And I thank you for the privilege to be able to, to preach and to teach. And I pray, God, that your words would, would be used to bring glory to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and minds to, to see these words, to hear these words, to understand these words, to live by these words. And God, maybe if there is anything that we don't quite understand, God, that you help us just to have faith in you. And God, I pray that you might help fill in some of the gaps, not just in this passage, but in others of things that we may not be quite sure of, dear Lord. I pray that you just would hide me behind the cross, that you would help me to say the words that you want me to say, that you would recall to my mind and that you would guide my mind and my mouth to go just where you want it to go, God. And I pray that these words would be a blessing to each one of us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, back up to verses 12, 13, and 14. Jesus is walking with his disciples, and he sees a fig tree. And the fig tree, from the distance, he sees has leaves. Now, these leaves would make one think that this fig tree was in bloom. If there are leaves that are being produced, there should be fruit on the tree. Now, Mark makes the point, and he says that it was not the season for figs. Now, there are certain fig trees, as I've done a little research, that will, that will sometimes produce fruit out of season, especially if they have uh, healthy branches. And it's not uncommon, even in this part of the world that we're talking about here, that there may be occasions, even out of season, when figs would be produced. And so it's possible, even though it was not the season for figs, the fact that Jesus saw the leaves on the tree led him to believe that there were figs to be eaten. Now, it says he was hungry, and he went to the tree, and when he found out that there were no figs on the tree, he cursed the tree. May nobody ever eat fruit from you again. Now, it has been, it has been uh, supposed by some, and this could be true, that maybe Jesus was throwing some type of temper tantrum, that he was mad at the tree and that he was making a point because it didn't produce fruit, and so he destroyed it. And there may be some truth to that in some way. It, 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 it may be that, that the tree was destroyed because it was not producing fruit, but I don't know that we could assume that Jesus was maybe throwing a temper tantrum and just being mad and saying, hey, you don't, you don't produce fruit, I'm going to be done with you. I think what Jesus was doing here was preparing to make a bigger point he, he was going to use this as a teaching opportunity for the disciples. He was doing something today that he knew tomorrow would allow him to be able to teach his disciples some lessons that were valuable to them. Now, I don't believe necessarily that Jesus was angry and showing the tree who was boss, although that's possible. It doesn't seem to really fit with, with Jesus's uh, who Jesus is and the way Jesus acts. He simply did this act, I believe, to prepare for a teaching that was going to take place. And Jesus curses this fig tree, and the disciples and Jesus go on their way. Now, as we skip down to verse 20, it says, Early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Now, Peter was kind of amazed at what had taken place. I mean, for a, 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 a plant or a tree to, to be completely withered at the roots is something that takes a while for that process to occur. Even if a tree dies and you see, you see 
on, on the exterior, on the branches and the leaves that it is dead, it takes quite some time for roots to wither on a tree. And so Peter saw this and he said, not only is this tree dead, I mean, this tree is completely destroyed. Its very roots have been destroyed. Now, it's kind of amazing, really, that Peter would be so shocked at this. I mean, of all the things that, that Jesus had done, he raised people from the dead. He had healed people of all kinds of sicknesses. He had driven out demons. It seems like Peter would say, oh, yeah, well, Jesus made a tree with her. That's no problem. But even still, with the power of Jesus, his disciples were still in awe of him. Even, even something like this that had to do with a tree. Peter and the disciples, I'm assuming the rest of them too, were probably in just as much shock. And he said, look, Jesus, that tree you cursed, it's already withered from the roots up. Now, before we get into Jesus' response to that, to that, for what uh, Peter said, we need to, I think, spend a little bit of time talking about this fig tree and the leaves and the fact that it was destroyed. Now, it doesn't tell us clearly in this passage. There is no connection that is made between this fig tree that is withered and dead and the people of Israel. However, this illustration that Jesus uses would fit with other illustrations in regards to the people of Israel who had rejected God. They were, they were God's chosen people, the people of Israel. And they should have been growing in the Lord and their branches should have been in the Lord. And by this time, the people of Israel should have been producing great fruit for the Lord. They had been reading God's word for years. They knew of God's miracles. They knew of God's mighty works. They should have been praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord, trusting in the Lord, and they should have been producing great fruit for the kingdom of God. However, what we see many times in Scripture is that there were at least some and, and possibly many of the people of Israel who had rejected God, who had no regard for God's word, as we saw in the last couple of weeks, no regard for God's temple. They did not praise God. They did not listen to God. They worshiped idols. They were religious, but they weren't righteous. They saw the very Son of God who had been with them and did miracle after miracle, and it preached the truth to them, and it told them the kingdom is here, enter into that kingdom. But they refused to enter into the kingdom of God. They refused to listen to Jesus Christ. There were many of God's people, Israel, who were producing no fruit whatsoever. Now, if you were to look at the people of Jesus' day, these who were accusing him, these Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, if you were to look at them from a distance, they had the appearance that they were godly people. They looked good. They attended church services. They knew God's word. They at least knew the letter of God's word. They didn't always understand it, but, but they knew all of these things about God, and they looked the part in every way. And they were at places where godly people were, would be. And they would even use language and say things that godly people would say. And they had this appearance that they were healthy, hearty, godly men and women. They looked that way on the outside. But on many occasions, Jesus would call them out. And he would say, your outside looks really good, but your inside is full of evil. And so they had the appearance, they were producing the leaves, but they weren't producing the fruit. They looked like godly people, but they were not living like godly people. They went through the motions, but they were not trusting the Lord. Now, we need to, to think about that for just one moment because we could be guilty of the same thing. We could, we could fall into that same trap. And so we must be careful in our life that we are not deceiving others or even worse, deceiving ourselves. 
We might have some leaves that look good. People in the community might look at me and they might look at you and they may say, wow, look at him, look at her. They are such a godly person. They're always at the church. They're always doing stuff for the church. I saw them out on the street giving food to the homeless. Wow. They're always posting scriptures on their Facebook page. They are so godly. And they see all those leaves. But is there really any fruit in our life? Now, that's a question that you're probably going to have to answer. I can't answer that. I guess we can to some extent. I guess we can, we can look at each other's lives and we can say, you know what, there's no fruit whatsoever coming from somebody's life, no matter how much they, they, they profess to be a Christian. But we really need to look at our own lives. And we need to ask ourselves that question. Am I producing leaves or am I producing fruit? Now, when John began to pe preach to the people as Jesus was coming on to the scene, he preached to them and he says, Repent and produce fruits that are in accordance with repentance. That is, if you repent, if you come to God, if you enter into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, then your life needs to change. And that repentance needs to be evidence and that there is good and godly fruit that's being produced in your life. Now, if we say that we are God's people, but we are not producing any fruit, and we are not living in God's Word, and being obedient to God's Word, and loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, and following the examples of Jesus Christ, no matter how hard His teachings may be or His examples may be, if we're not doing any of those things, we are not going to produce fruit. And the people of Israel, many of God's people, the Jewish people, were not producing fruit. They were producing leaves, but they were not producing fruit. And when Jesus went to this fig tree, he saw there were leaves and he expected there to be fruit, but when he got close, there was no fruit. And so what did he do? He destroyed the tree. Now, that's pretty intense. That's pretty intense. And we don't see this, this comparison or this illustration between this fig tree and the nation of Israel. But I do not believe it's unreasonable at all in the whole context of Scripture to make this illustration here, to make this connection. And even though God's people should have been those who were seeking Him, they weren't. And so what did God do? He opened up the kingdom to a people who would seek him, who would trust him, who would listen to him, who would produce fruit. And all of those branches that weren't producing fruit, the scripture says they're cut off. And new branches are grafted into the tree so that they can produce fruit. Now we want to make sure if we are a follower of Jesus Christ, there is fruit that is being produced in our life. Because we see in Scripture some pretty strong language as to what happens for those who do not produce fruit. They may not be part of the tree after all. They may look the part, but they are not living for the Lord. And so I believe when Jesus gives this story here and he sets up this event where he curses this fig tree, that may be part of the, of the message that's, that's, that's being presented here. Maybe not. But even if that's not what Jesus is saying here, that is what is said frequently in the rest of the New Testament. It's not hard to make that connection. And so Jesus curses this fig tree and it dies. And he is... I believe, most certainly preparing for his response. He knows what's going to happen. He knows when this tree is withered and when they pass by that his disciples will ask questions. And that question will give him an opportunity to teach them. Because that's what Jesus wanted to do. That's what he had been doing for three years. He wanted to teach them. He wanted them to be ready to go into service for him. He had discipled them. He wanted them to know what he said. He wanted them to know his words. He wanted them to follow his example. 
He wanted them to grow in Him. And He wants you and I to grow in Him. He wants us to know His Word. He wants us to know His example. That's why it's so important for us to be in God's Word and to dig through God's Word and to seek God's Word and say, God, help me to understand Your Word. God, I'm reading it and I don't get it. God, I've seen this and I don't know how it makes sense. God, I see this and I don't know where it ties into something else. But God, I want to get it. And ask God to help us understand the things we can't. And the things we do, we praise God for them. Say, God, I get this. I get this truth of your word. I understand the power of your word. I understand the strength of your word. I understand the example of Jesus Christ. And God, help me to be like him. That's what Jesus wanted of his 12 disciples. And that's what he wants of you and I as well. He wants us to grow in him. He wants us to grow to be ready to be a servant for the kingdom of God, to continue the work that he had started, to continue the work that he had started. That's why he was pouring into the disciples. He was wanting them when the time come and he, uh, his life was taken and he was resurrected and he was gone to be in heaven, he wanted them to continue the work that he had started. And guess what he wants you and me to do? To continue the work that he had started. And so everything he tells the disciples, everything he does, was for a purpose. There was a reason. There was something in that that he could teach them, that they could learn from. And we only see a smidgen of what went on with Jesus and the disciples. There were three years of things that occurred. And we only get a smidgen of it. Just think of all the things that Jesus taught them in the rest of the time. Maybe they were just kicked back by the pool. Maybe he didn't teach them nothing. Maybe he said, all right, we'll take, the, we'll take a couple months off. Maybe all that's recorded for them is the things he did. But I don't believe that's the case. I can only imagine how Jesus taught and poured into these men valuable lessons to teach them wisdom, to strengthen their faith, to help them, to prepare them to continue his work. And I believe this story is an example of that. This fig tree had withered, and Peter responds, Wow, Rabbi, look at this. Just yesterday you cursed this fig tree, and today it is completely destroyed. And then Jesus' response seems kind of strange to us, maybe. Because when Peter says that, Jesus says, Have faith in God. I assure you, anyone who says to this, or excuse me, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Now, what in the world does that have to do with cursing the fig tree? It doesn't really seem like it fits, does it? I mean, he cursed a fig tree, and he says, have faith. Whatever you have faith in, you can do. You can move mountains if you have enough faith, and you do not doubt. Now, Mark's account is not quite as clear and may leave a scratch in our head. Thankfully, Matthew's account does give a little different response there that does help us to tie this, this response into the event that had just occurred. If you want to turn to Matthew, you can. Matthew 21, verse 21. This is Matthew's recorded response, and it does help, help us to see the direction that Jesus is going, maybe a little better than Mark does. In Matthew 21, 21, it says, Jesus answered them, I assure you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you tell this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, it will be done. So here Matthew makes this connection for us. Jesus says, look, you have just seen something amazing that has taken place. You have just seen, seen me curse a fig tree and at my word, the fig tree withered. Now, this is a pretty amazing thing that took place. And Jesus says, as recorded in Mark's, or Matthew's response, he says, look, you have seen this thing done to, done to this fig tree. 
And I assure you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you tell a mountain to be moved, it'll be moved, Jesus said. So Jesus is trying to grow the disciples' faith. He wants the disciples know to know that there is power that they can access through him. That there is a great power if their faith is strong enough and they trust in him and they follow him and they are obedient to him, that the very type of things that they have seen him do will be accessible to them. That through him, his power will be with them even when he is gone. His power will still be evident. And so he says, look, you've seen this great thing happen. Well, I want to tell you, you too can do great things if you have faith. Now, we know that Peter had took this message to heart because when we read in the book of Acts after Jesus has ascended and gone back to heaven, we see Peter doing some miraculous things, some of the same type of things that Jesus did while he was ministering. And so this lesson that Jesus was trying to get across that, look, I have done something great, and if you have faith in me and trust in me, you too can do great things. Now, this is not an, an uncommon lesson. We, we see this again in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 17, if you want to flip back there, we see Jesus use very similar language to this. In Matthew 17, verses 19 through 20, The disciples were having trouble driving out a demon. And they were coming to Jesus and asking, why couldn't we do this? And in Matthew 17, 19 through 20, this is what it says. Then the disciples approached Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we drive it out? Because of your little faith, he told them. For I assure you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed... You will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. So we see this teaching is pretty clear to us, what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about the faith that his disciples should have. And that through, by that faith in him, uh, they will be able to do mighty things in Jesus Christ. And the same, I believe, is true for you and I. I believe that we too uh, can, can find much power in Jesus Christ. And we too should be strong in our faith. That's the first part of Jesus' response. If we flip back to Mark chapter 11, if we flip back to Mark chapter 11, verse 24, we see a different topic that we could discuss. Now, it's clear that we should have faith in God. We can get that from this passage we just read, and we can get that all throughout Scripture. That is not a hard, a hard truth to, to discover and see and, and, and to be reinforced throughout the pages of Scripture, that we must have faith in God, that our power, that our deliverance, that our salvation comes from our faith in Jesus Christ. That's a clear teaching. And we could just pop out those last verse or two that we looked at and we could really talk hard about faith and we could we could dig in deeper to other scriptures about faith but i think it's better for us to look at this whole passage in the context because all of these things that jesus talks about they go together in some way because he's presenting them here all together in one way now you could say that the verse we just read uh, verse 23 and 24 go together and and they do go together in some way there is a definite connection between what's being talked about but we could pull out verse 24 by itself <laughs> and many people do and we'll talk about that right now because verse 24 says something that may be hard for us to to wrap our head around and to consider and to understand what it is saying. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, it says, Therefore I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them and you will have them. Now, we need to be careful with verses like these. It is easy for us to pluck out one verse of Scripture 
and get a meaning that, 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 that may not be accurate. Now, you could make the Bible support anything you wanted to if you could just pick and choose verses. You could make the Bible support anything, even horrible evils, if you just simply pluck out one verse. And so when we read Scripture, and I don't know that I've stressed this much lately. I used to say it all the time, and I'll say it today. When you read Scripture, you need to understand the context. You need to understand what is going on in the verse, verses before, in the verses after, in the chapter before, in the chapter after, in the book, in, in the events that happened before that book, and the events that happened after that book. There needs to be context to what is going on, to language that's being used, to, to, to the point that, that the speaker, that the writer, that Jesus himself, in this case, is trying to make. And if we, if we pluck a verse or two out of context and we don't understand what's going on or we don't understand that, that language in the Bible is used in a different way maybe than we use language, then, then we might get ourselves into trouble because we might say, boy, does the Bible really teach this or does the Bible really teach that? And so when you read God's Word, you need to read it in context. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't verses that maybe that speak to you, that you draw a lot of power from, that there aren't verses that you memorize and that you recite. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have single verses. I'm not saying that it's wrong to ever use a single verse or preach from a single verse or teach from a single verse. I'm not saying that that is wrong. I'm just saying that we need to have some understanding about what God's Word says. I say that because even in the last few weeks, we've looked at things and, and we may look at those things and say, well, that is a contradiction. What are we supposed to do? Are we, are we supposed to answer a fool in his foolishness or are we not supposed to answer a fool in his foolishness? Well, Proverbs says both. So which one is it? Which one is true? Well, both are true. Well, how can they both be true? They both that, That's two different things you told us. They can both be true because there are times that we need to answer a fool in his foolishness and there are times that we don't need to answer a fool in his foolishness. And I don't view that as a contradiction. And there are many things that we see in God's Word that it may appear that they're saying something in, in one passage, and it may appear that there's something different that's being said in another passage. So some people would say, well, I'm just throwing it all out. I can't trust any of it. But that's foolishness. That's foolishness. Because if we read God's Word in its context, then usually we can understand, oh, the reason why this was said in this spot is because this is the point that the author was trying to make. This is the point that the prophet was trying to make. This is the point that Jesus was trying to make. This is the point that God wanted to get across his people in this point. And he used this language, and he used this example in this place, and he used another example in another place, and spoke in maybe different languages because he was trying to get a different point across to his people. And so we need to understand the context. And in this verse right here, this is a verse that is often used as a standalone verse. And I'll let you decide for yourself what you believe Jesus is teaching here, and we may come to different conclusions, and that is okay. But it says, Therefore I tell you, all the things you pray and ask for, believe that you have received them, and you will have them. Now, that is a passage that is very popular in the Word of Faith movement. You may have heard of it. And, and, and a popular part of that teaching is that God wants to give you everything that you have ever wanted. And the only reason that you don't have it is because you have not asked with enough faith. And this verse is cited often. If there is anything you ask for, anything you want, if your faith is strong enough, if you do not doubt, you'll get it. You want to be healthy? All you got to do is ask and not doubt, and it'll be given to you. Your health will be restored. You want a lot of money? All you got to do is ask, and it will be given to you. You want a nice house? All you got to do is ask, 
and it will be given to you. Because Jesus says, everything that you ask for, you will have. And ask for and believe that you have received them, and you will have them. And many people would say, all right, I believe it in my mind. I believe it. I believe, I believe that I'm going to have a million dollars in my bank account tomorrow. God, I believe it. I see it. I see it in my mind. I see the one and the six zeros after it. I see it when I pull up my bank account in the morning. I see it, and God, I believe it. I know you are great. I know you are awesome. I know you are all-powerful, and I believe it, and I trust it. And God, I'm asking you. And Jesus said, if I ask for these things, I will have them. And there are a lot of people who do that. And they don't get the things that they are asking for. And they ask and they ask and they ask and they ask and they ask. And they say, well, golly, I must not have faith. Jesus said I could move mountains if I had enough faith. I just want a new car. Surely if my faith will get me to move a mountain, it'll get me a car. I must not have faith. And they'll pray. And they'll pray and they'll pray and they'll say, but Jesus, your word says that if I ask for these things, I'll have them. Now, I know that Jesus says that here. But I don't believe in the context of all of Scripture that Jesus means that he wants us to have a bunch of money and a nice car and a house and all we got to do is ask and he'll give them to us. And all we got to do is ask and he will heal our every single sickness and deliver us from every single suffering. I know what Jesus says here, but I also know the context of all of Scripture and what Jesus says and what Jesus teaches. And if we pluck this passage out, and only this passage, we may get something from it that's not what Jesus is saying. And the problem with, with this mindset that God doesn't want anybody to be unhappy, that God doesn't want anybody to be sick, that God doesn't want anybody to be poor, the problem with this mindset is we believe that God is here to serve us. God, I am at the center of the universe. God, you are waiting for me to ask. God, you are waiting to put money in my account. You are waiting to heal my sickness. You are waiting to give me a car. You are waiting to give me a house. And God, I'm at the center of the universe. And God, you are here to serve me. And I'm going to ask you, God, because what you want more than anything is to serve me and to give to me and to bless me. Now, I believe that God wants to bless us, and I believe he does. And I believe that God listens to our prayers and he hears our prayers. And sometimes he gives us those worldly things that we desire. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he heals our sickness. I do believe that God wants us to be happy. I do believe that God wants us to be healed. But I do not believe that it is always God's will for those things to occur. And if we get this mindset that God, I want, I want, I want, and you are to give. Because Jesus said, if I ask for it, I'll have it. And when we have that mindset and that attitude... We turn God into a God who serves us. But that's not what Scripture calls us to. We are not to look to God as our servant, as our genie, who will grant our every wish. We are to put God at the center of our universe. We are not to be served by God. We are to be serving God because God has already served us in Jesus Christ. He served us till death on a cross. And we are to serve God. We are not to depend on God to grant our every wish and desire, although he does sometimes. Praise the Lord. He's good like that. That's great. But God must be at the center of our universe. And we must be serving him. So what are we to make of passages like Mark 11 
24. Well, let's talk for just a moment about the will of God. If you want to turn to 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, well, we'll look at a few verses here that will help us to understand this topic a little better. When we are talking about asking God and praying to God, we also need to remember the will of God. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it says this. Now this is the confidence we have before Him. Whenever we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Now, that's similar language at the beginning. We ask anything, right? That's kind of what Jesus was saying. But what do we see in 1 John? Whenever we ask anything, what's the stipulation? According to His will. According to the will of God. He hears us. He hears us when we pray according to His will. And if we know that He hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked Him for. If we ask God according to God's will... He will provide what we ask. We can know that He hears those prayers and will answer those prayers. Now, I think this is an important verse for us to remember when we look at verses like Mark eleven twenty four 24. And John chapter 15, verse 7. And John chapter 15, verse 7, we also see similar language to what we see in Mark eleven twenty four. 24. But we also see a little... A little something else there. We see a little if. Well, that word if, that changes a lot, doesn't it, right? We see that word if. That means there's, there's a stipulation, there's a requirement, there's, there's something else to be considered. I will give you $100, every one of you. All right, everybody says all right. If you will hike to Alaska and bring me a block of ice from Alaska and bring it back. Dang it. Well, that if changes it, right? Everybody wants $100, but that if, there's, there's a requirement, there's something that, that goes into that to receive that $100. John chapter 15, verse 7, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. If you remain in me, Jesus says, if you remain in my words, while my words remain in you. That is, if you listen to me, if you follow me, if you listen to my words, if you're obedient to my words, if you're, if you're listening to my example, if I'm the center of your universe and you're doing all you can to, to follow me and listen to me and serve me, if you remain in me, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. Now that's pretty straightforward. Praise the Lord. God wants to answer our prayers. He hears our prayers. We need to ask Him when we have problems, when we have, when we have trials, when we have diseases, we want to be healed. But James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3 is a good passage. It says, You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. All right, well, that's what Jesus is saying, right? In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, ask, and it will be given. That's what he says in John 15, 7. Ask me. I want you to ask me. I want to give it to you. And, and James says, look, you do not have because you do not ask. But then let's see what he says after that. In verse 3. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your evil desires. Now, isn't that something? James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And when you do ask... You do not have because you're asking with the wrong motives. 
You want your own evil desires to be fulfilled. You are not praying for God's will. You are praying for your will. And you do not have what you ask for because you are asking for what is evil and not of what is of God. And so when we pray, we must pray that God's will be done. And Jesus did just that in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. And we'll talk about this in a few weeks when we get here. But in Mark 14, 36, Jesus says, And he said, Abba, which means Father, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now, how did Jesus pray? He prayed that God's will be done. Even in the midst of all of this great suffering, he says, God, I pray that your will be done. And guess what happened to Jesus? His life was taken, or his life was given. Might be a better way to put it. He was nailed to a cross. But Jesus prayed. He prayed to God that if any way that this cup could be delivered, he asked for God to deliver him from this. And he died on a cross. Jesus must not have had enough faith. Because he asked the Father to give it to him. And he didn't give it to him. He didn't give him deliverance from the cup of wrath. Well, that's not true. We can't accuse Jesus of not having enough faith. If anybody had enough faith when he prayed for something, it was Jesus. And yet, even though what he prayed for was not answered in the way that he asked. You know why? Because it was not the will of God. He prayed. He prayed for what he desired. And he prayed from his heart. But it was not the will of God. And Jesus didn't get mad and say, well, wait a minute. I've been telling people anything they ask they could get. Now you're not going to give me this? No, he didn't. He said, God, it doesn't matter what I want because I want to serve you. I'm not here, God, to be served. I'm here to serve you. And God, I pray that this cup would pass from me. If in any way possible, God, spare me from this. But not my will, but your will. Now that's good stuff right there. That's how we need to pray, brothers and sisters in Christ. Not for our worldly wealth and worldly riches. If there's something you need, pray to God. And maybe He'll give it to you and maybe He won't if it's not His will. I'm not saying that we should never pray for materialistic things. There may be genuine needs we have. But we must pray for the will of God to be fulfilled. And we can learn from Jesus in this passage. I know we're going long, but it's okay. Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. Now we've seen kind of this, this focus on, 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 on faith here in these first verse, verse or two. And, and now here in verse 24, we've seen this idea of, 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 of prayer and asking God and God, God giving us the things that we need. And now we shift even in a different direction here at the end of this passage. In verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. But if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your wrongdoing. Now we shift gears to forgiveness. Again, this is a topic we could, we could spend a whole sermon on. And we could talk about forgiveness. And we could look at forgiveness in all of Scripture. But yet, Jesus ties this in right here. He hadn't said anything about forgiveness. He curses a fig tree, and now all of a sudden he's on forgiveness a couple of verses later. I mean, he has covered some ground in these last few verses here. He, is, he has covered some important topics. And he is telling the disciples here, look, when you pray... If, if, if you have anything against anyone, then you need to forgive them. Now, this is a good lesson, right? Because it's hard for our heart to be right and to pray, God, pray to God with a right heart if we're holding on to grudges and anger and we are not forgiving people who have sinned against us. 
And so if we are going to serve God and we are going to carry on the mission of Jesus Christ, then we must get our own lives right. We must ask for forgiveness and forgive people who have, forgi- or who have sinned against us, who have wronged us. We must forgive those people. Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, look, you need to have faith. You need to ask that I provide for your needs. And you need to forgive those who have done you wrong so that God will forgive you of your wrongs. Jesus is telling the disciples here several important lessons that you and I need to learn. Lessons that really follow the pattern of Jesus' own life. That Jesus had faith. That Jesus did powerful things. That's the lesson that... He wants his disciples to have. He wants his disciples to know that in me you can do great things with your faith because it is faith in God that that allows us to access the power of God. It's not just being around Jesus or being around God's Word or being around a church that gives us access to the power of God. It is putting our faith in Jesus Christ which allows us to access the power of God and see the glory of God in just a little way while we are on this earth. It was faith that healed people. When people would come to Jesus, it wasn't that they got close to him. It wasn't that they simply touched his clothes. It was that their faith was strong. And that's why Jesus said, your faith has made you well. Because the power of God is accessed through faith in Jesus Christ. And we can experience that power and we can do mighty things, things that we never imagined we could do if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells his disciples, you see this fig tree is cursed? Oh, you don't even know. If you put your faith in me and you trust in me, I'm going to use you to do great things. And I can tell you that, thing, that same uh, statement is true for you and I today. That God still wants to use us to do great things if we put our faith in Him. That God still wants to answer our prayers. That God wants to hear from us. Jesus did great things and so will we. Jesus prayed to God in His deepest, darkest moment and He said, God, let Your will be done. And so should we. We should pray to God knowing that if we pray with a right heart, He will hear us. If we pray with an evil heart, He will not hear us. The Scripture's pretty clear in that. If we're trusting in Jesus Christ and we're focusing on Jesus Christ and we're praying for the will of God, then guess what? God is going to hear those prayers and He is going to answer those prayers. If we're praying for evil, well, good luck. Good luck. Jesus tells His disciples, Look, you want to follow in my example and you want to, you want to show the power of God that you have seen in me, you can do it through faith in me. You pray to the Father, you ask the Father, but you pray that God's will be done. You want to be like me? You forgive those who sin against you, and God will forgive you. Boy, Jesus covers a lot of ground right here in just a few verses, right? And these are things that you and I must live by. These are things that he wanted his disciples to live by because he wanted them to continue his mission. And he wants you and I to continue his mission and tell the world who he is, that he is the Savior, that he gave his life on a cross so that we could be forgiven. And Jesus says, this is how you need to live. This is the life you need to live. And Jesus did all of these things. Jesus forgave those who nailed him to a cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus says, this is what you need to do. Jesus didn't just tell his disciples what to do. He always showed his disciples what to do. Everything that Jesus said and told his disciples to do, you can see him doing it. You can see him living it out. You need to remember the Lord's Prayer. kind of goes along with these verses in some way. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will come be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Even the Lord's Prayer in some way parallels this very teaching that Jesus taught here. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done. How are we to pray? We are to pray to a holy God that His will is accomplished, even if it goes against our will and we don't understand it. Are we to ask God for what we need? Absolutely. Give us this day our daily bread. God, give us what we need. Those are good prayers when we pray that we would live by and live out the will of God and that we would ask God for things we need, not for ourselves, but so that we can, we can grow in Him and that we can use what we have to help others. Those are beautiful prayers. That's a beautiful heart. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Give us today our daily bread, the things we need. And God, let us forgive those who sin against us so that you will forgive us. If we want to continue the work of Christ, if we want to continue the work of the disciples, then we need to learn from all that Jesus said in this passage, and it's a lot, and we've, we've only really scratched the surface today. But listen, brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus encountered a bunch of men and women who looked the part of godly people on the outside, who had the leaves that people could see but produced no fruit because they weren't doing these things that Jesus said. They weren't seeking the will of God. They weren't forgiving one another. And they certainly did not have faith in Jesus Christ. And I can assure you that just as this fig tree was destroyed, just as this fig tree experienced the wrath of Jesus Christ, I can assure you that if there are any here today or any listening online who do not put their faith in Jesus Christ, I can assure you that you will suffer the same fate. Oh, what a beautiful thing it is, though when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, when we are rooted in Jesus Christ, when we are rooted in God's Word, and we are living the way He tells us to live. It's a good passage. I encourage you to read it and pray over it this week and think about this and let us each look at our lives to see if we are bearing fruit. And if we're not, then we need to seek God. We need to say, God, I got some stuff I need to clean up. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these good words today. God, this is a lot for us to soak in and to consider and think about. But I pray, God, that you were glorified by the reading of these words. I pray that in our hearts, God, we have heard you speak today. God, I pray that if there are any in this room that are not yours, if there are any listening online right now, God, that they would seek you, that they would come to you. God, that they would find life in you. Dear Lord, that's what you want of us. That's what you sent Jesus for, was to bring us life to give us life and to give us life abundantly, dear Lord. And God, I pray that if there are any who have not experienced that life in Jesus, that today, God, they would move their root system from one that will surely wither to one that will be well watered for all of eternity in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for those in this room that are yours. Maybe they are looking at their life and maybe they have seen some leaves, but maybe they know deep down there is some fruit that's not being produced. Maybe there's a little fruit, dear Lord. Maybe they desire to produce a little more. I pray that you would help them, God. I pray that as we look at these words that you would strengthen our faith in you. God, that we would know we can do mighty things through you. There may be things that we are up against now, difficulties we have at work or at school. Whatever it may be, and we think, man, God, this is too much. I can't overcome this. Oh, yes, we can, God. Your word tells us we can move mountains if we trust in you. So we can certainly overcome through your power our struggles. And God, when we pray to you, we pray that your will is done. And God, it is not always easy, but let us not lose heart. Let us not lose hope. But God, to know even when there is great suffering involved, that is sometimes your will. Dear Lord Jesus Christ showed us that example. Whether it's sickness or hard times or whatever it may be that we're going through, God, we seek you and we pray to you and we know you hear those prayers and God, we thank you that sometimes you answer those prayers. But God, when it's not your will, 
let us not question or doubt you. But let us know that you are right in all you do. Even when we don't understand, God, you are right. God, let us be able to pray to you, not selfish prayers, but prayers for your glory and for your kingdom. Prayers for our good and for the good of our service to you in this world, dear Lord. And God, I pray that if there are grudges that we hold on to today, that we let those things go. God, that if there are people we don't like, that we forgive them. That we don't hold on to that. That that doesn't steal our joy and fill us with evil. Because God, what we want, what we desire, what we need more than anything in this world is your forgiveness. And so God, I pray that we experience that. And when we do, we give that forgiveness to others. And if we're not doing that today, God, we need to search our heart. We need to get that junk out. And we need to forgive those who have sinned against us. And we need to ask you, God, to forgive us. God, thank you for these words. Let us be about your work. Let us be about your mission. God, you have prepared your disciples and you are preparing us through your word and by your Holy Spirit that we would be obedient to your work. And God, I pray that we are growing in you and your word and that we will be ready for and about your work when we leave this building today. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's service. To learn more about Jesus, call or text Pastor Shan at 601-657-0180 or email him at shanvn at me.com. You can also visit us at www.enterprisebaptist.church or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Liberty. We hope that you have been blessed by today's service.